Welcome to all the attendees. This is the American Values Coalition. You are joining our first webinar. And it's a conversation with David French and Charlie Sykes on conservative media and misinformation and conspiracies. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about us, the American Values Coalition, we're a brand new 501c3. Uh, and our mission statement says, we are growing a community of Americans empowered to lead with truth, reject extremism and misinformation and defend democracy. And we're particularly concerned about the misinformation coming from right-wing media sources, you know, which is the topic of our uh, first webinar. Uh, just, uh, so, just so you know, there we do believe and understand that there is misinformation that comes from liberal media sources as well, and uh, that there's a liberal media bubble that some people are in. That's a great topic of conversation. It's not the topic of this webinar. We are talking about conservative media sources. Uh, I just say that to anticipate some of the what about isms that come in response to events like this that I'm sure Charlie's familiar with. <laughs> uh, to learn more about us, go to AmericanValues.org is our website. If you're live tweeting this, please tag us. Uh, our Twitter handle is at OurValuesNGO. Um, and so we can keep track of uh, all the live tweets that uh, y'all are doing, if you were doing. So let me uh, introduce our host, um, our, our discussants. Uh, first, we have uh, Charlie Sykes. Charlie is a writer, commentator, and public speaker. He's the founder and editor at large of The Bulwark. Uh, I've written a few pieces there for The Bulwark as well. And he's also a host of The Bulwark podcast and an MSNBC contributor. He's authored my, nine books, and his most recent was How the Right Lost Its Mind, which was published in 2017. And uh, there's just a very long list of publications and news programs that he's been on and written for. And since we only have an hour, I'm not going to name them all. <laughs> uh, he had a 23-year career in conservative talk radio. Uh, and if Wikipedia is to be believed, uh, he started in journalism in the 1960s, which he looks way too young for that to be the case. So I don't believe that's true. Like 70s, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also have David French, who's trying to log in now. Uh, David is the senior editor of The Dispatch uh, and a columnist for Time. And most recently, he was added to the Atlantic's new newsletter section. I, I just signed up for his news, newsletter this morning. Uh, and he has a new one out this morning. Uh, you should check out it's, uh, he, he wrote about uh, masculinity on and, you know, write uh, conservative responses to the masculinity crisis. Um, he was previously a staff writer at National Review. And prior to becoming a full-time writer, he worked as an attorney for the American Center for Law and Justice and Alliance Defending Freedom. And he was the president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. Uh, and since tomorrow is Veterans Day, I should also mention that he was a former major in the US Army Reserve and he's an Iraq War veteran. So uh, good thing I was uh, planning to go to Charlie first, <laughs> since David isn't here yet. Um, so what, what happened to conservative media in the Trump era? How did it change? Talk about how it changed. Well, I, I, hey, first of all, uh, thanks for the in, uh, the invitation. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer your question uh, briefly. I, I actually think that the transformation of uh, conservative media took place even before the Trump era. I think it's accelerated. But I think that was a pre-existing condition. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten Donald Trump. And I, and I think that David and I were both part of the conservative media for many years. And we sort of watched it and watched the transformation. Um, and, you know, it's, you know it, it's one of those things where I keep going back and saying, okay, what was the turning point? When did it become, go from being the other side of the story to becoming an echo chamber, to becoming a bubble, to becoming the alternative reality silos that it's become right now? Because I think that there was a time 
when the conservative media thought of itself as the alternative media. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember, I didn't start in the 60s, but I, but I am old enough to remember when, you know, if, if you were to say, what is conservative media? You'd say, well, National Review comes uh, twice a week, uh, you know, twice a month. Uh, you, you might have the Wall Street Journal editorial page, but it was a very, very small voice. And then, of course, in the late 1980s, you had the rise of conservative talk radio on AM. I mean, AM radio was nothing back in the in the 1980s. It was sort of like this abandoned strip mall and that, that group. But I think it's important to remember that the, there was no talk radio. There was no Fox News. There was no Breitbart.com during the Reagan era that you had conservative uh, ascendancy without the conservative media. Then comes the conservative media. And I think in the beginning that it was largely substantive that it was largely driven by ideas and focused on policy. And to make the long story short, what happened, I think, was that it became the entertainment wing of the right wing, that it became the entertainment wing of the Republican Party. And as a result, I think, became less and less tethered to any sort of intellectual coherence or any sort of uh, focus on policy. And it became much more interested in the triggering in, in, that, in that very, very competitive race for, for clicks and eyeballs and ears. And, and I think that you saw this by the time Donald Trump came along. Donald Trump really was the first of the talk radio candidates for president, very much attuned to the, the rhythms and the themes of conservative talk radio, understanding what the hot buttons were. And so by 2015, 2016, most of the conservative media, and we're now we're talking primarily electronic, was completely primed for someone like a Donald Trump. And of course, uh, we've seen what's happened since he became president. But uh, Donald Trump would never have become president had the conservative media not become what it did over the last several decades. And that's a very, very short answer uh, for you. And I'm sure that we'll get into it in more detail. Yeah, I mean, but it, uh, yeah, so it's you're saying it's driven by the clicks, driven by sure. wanting to satisfy their their readers their viewers their listeners um but I, I think even back in 2016 just to i don't know if i could imagine it being so disassociated from reality the degree it is today um so and, and there's i mean that right now there's two main concerns that i have regarding the disinformation uh one is regarding uh the vaccines and the vaccine disinformation that's having you know, uh, negative effects on, on our health, our ability to stop the spread of this pandemic. And then there's the disinformation regarding the election, which is now being used as an excuse to uh, pass legislation in state level legislation and state level races to undermine, potentially undermine future elections. Yeah. I mean, I mean how, how, how they get so bad so quickly? Well, it was it, it, again. I mean, look, all of all of the the things that we're seeing now were there in prototype before 2016. But you're absolutely right, and I remember saying um, back then that everything that's happening now is going to get worse. But at, to your point, it has gotten worse, um, much worse, and much faster than I expected it would be. And you know, I would I would add one other uh, you know category here. It's not just the vaccine and disinformation and the big lie disinformation, but it's also um, a, a raw sort of approach to race that would have really, um, I, I think, crossed the line of the pre-Trumpian conservative media. Although, again, it was all there. What's happened is it's become more dominant. And I, and I think that, you know, part of the problem has been that conservative media has been so effective. It has been so thorough in its penetration of the conservative movement. And it has driven out any of the, I would think of the referees or the guardrails, um, the, the people who would have said, whoa, okay, we don't wanna go here. We don't wanna talk about replacement theory. Okay, we can be against big government, but you know, do we really wanna rail against vaccines? And um, you know, election denialism is, is dangerous. Um, but those voices have been shoved aside. They are, they're no longer relevant. They no longer have the power to be able to, to control things. But, but 
to your point, though, one of the things that really strikes me is the way the window has moved. The things that used to have been confined to what I describe as the fever swamps of the right, the, the woolier conspiracy theories, uh, things that you would have found, say, on Alex Jones's Infowars or on something like Gateway Pundit, you're now seeing on prime time Fox News shows. So this window of extremism, recklessness, and disinformation has moved from the fringes. It's always been there now to the mainstream. And I have to say that I find it shocking that uh, the people who run Fox News have decided that they are okay with that, including members of the board of directors of Fox, like, like my old friend, Paul Ryan. Um, and, and, this, and this has happened um, in a relatively short period of time. And I think part of the problem has been, and I'm sure David will have uh, input into this, is, is there this, the, there's two things. Number one, it's almost like watching drug dealers where, where you, you stoke the outrage and the anger and the extremism and you keep having to, you know, hand out the purer stuff. And there's a competition there. I was among those who thought that maybe Fox News might pivot to be more like a traditional news source, might want to restore some of its credibility. Instead, I think the dynamic has been they're looking over their shoulders at the folks like Newsmax and OAN, that there's always somebody more extreme, more shrill out there, and they don't want to be outflanked. So what you have is, is kind of a race. Um, you could call it a race to the bottom, but it's certainly a race to make sure that you're the guy who's peddling the strongest, most potent stuff on the street corner. Otherwise, the base is going to go to somebody else. And left behind are the people who go, wait, remember when this was all about ideas and policy and principles? Because it hasn't been for a very long time. Why isn't Fox concerned about their ad buyers? I mean, besides the My Pillow guy, well, they ought to be, you know, and and the advertisers, I, I think, ought to be, you know, held accountable for it. I'm not in, generally in favor of ad boycotts at all. However, you know, there's no moral obligation to, you know, provide revenue to those sorts of things. Um, the only answer that I can give you is that it is working for them. Um, it is profitable. Uh, obviously, you know, in a, in a rational, sane universe, somebody would call in Tucker Carlson and say, you know, Tucker, when you're talking about the replacement theory, that's going too far. When you are uh, peddling disinformation about vaccines, that's that's too dangerous. So when you're undermining democracy by lying about the election, um, that's that's off brand for us. But no one is doing that, or if they have done it, it has no effect. And knowing what we do about the mass media, you only have to assume it's because this is working for them that it has not affected their bottom line. And until it does, I don't expect to see any change. Maybe David. David's less cynical than I am. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, what, 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 what's your prognosis? What has happened to conservative media in the Trump era? Well, I, I've got one quick answer as to why um, the advertiser issue doesn't matter as much because of... Uh, subscriber fees, affiliate fees. In other words, the, the amount of money that is paid to Fox for cable to carry the channel is a huge source of revenue flow. So as long as Fox is strong on its ratings and strong in that, that mix, it's, it's got this giant financial firewall behind it. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're beginning to reach a point where we got a chicken or egg problem in, in conservative media in the sense that there is going back years um, conservative media and began building kind of a tsunami that was, they began to build this sort of wave, this sort of energy, this incredible populist wave. And so now it's just a tsunami. And a lot of these people think, well, I can't change it. It's like, um, you know, how long can you swim against the Mississippi, <laughs> you know, uh, to mix my water metaphors. So what ends up happening is people surf the tsunami in different kinds of ways. But in, in again, you have a chicken or egg. It's, it's as if the surfer also builds the tsunami as well. By joining with it, you make it bigger. But any one entity or any one organization 
feels as if it will be swamped if it tries to turn the other direction. I realize it made a mess of all that water, but you get the, the general idea. And so, you know, and, and you have all of these sort of individualized examples from the political world of so-and-so stood up and then he lost his platform. So-and-so stood up and he lost his platform. And then a lot of these big conservative entities are very adept cancel, uh, practitioners of cancel culture themselves. Um, are you invited on to talk to talk radio anymore? If you're uh, a Trump, if you dissent from Trump, are you a guest on Fox anymore? Are you, you know, so you, so then what begins to happen is you, you build this media ecosystem that is both captive to the wave and building the wave at the exact same time. I think that's right. No, and, and I think, and a lot of it is driven by the audience. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, I certainly remember. But look, look. I mean, is there are there any anti-Trump voices in the electronic um, right-wing media any longer? And the answer is, I don't really think there are. Um, in part because the audience has decided that they want it, uh, they want conservative talk radio and Fox News, et cetera, to be a safe space for them. So there's very little tolerance for dissenting views. I mean, there's no chance that David French or I will be on Fox News anytime soon. It's just not going to happen. It will never, it will never, it will never happen. But I remember being on conservative talk radio, you know, for 23 years. And for the vast majority of that time, I had a very strong bond with my listeners. You know, radio mm. is a very intimate, uh, you know, medium. You're, you're in people's heads. You're there every single day. You're an ongoing conversation. But I think what changed is, that as the conservative media grew, there were so many other outlets. So what I found was increasingly that the audience was intolerant of certain ideas and they were demanding certain kinds of products and it became more and more difficult to push back against it. So since you're talking about disinformation, I've told this story before, you know, for years, I would always push back against, you know, people would send me an email about the number of, you know, bodies of Hillary Clinton's victims that were stacked up in a warehouse in Ohio or whatever. And I would push back and say, okay, well, that's not true. You understand that. I mean, you know, we can be conservatives. We don't have to believe X, Y, and Z. And for, you know, for years and years, the reaction I would get from people would be, okay, hey, thanks. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm not going to forward Uncle Otto's crazed emails anymore. But but starting in 2015, really, and really accelerating through 2016, what I found was that it was almost impossible to push back against the disinformation. I mean, I would send an article from from, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post or NPR or the Atlantic, and people would say, well, those are liberal rags. We're 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 not going to listen to them. And then it began to dawn on me to <laughs> that that in fact, what had happened is that we'd created this impenetrable silo, that uh, these stories had become non-falsifiable. And the audience really um, began to drive, you know, by its taste. So, you know, there's a reason why the conservative talk show hosts who had opposed Trump in 2016 are either gone or are supportive now, because right now the media is in many ways following its audience as much as it is driving its audience. I'd be interested in David's feelings about that, because I mean, th that's the chicken and egg, because yeah. people think this is what they want and it's true, but nobody's testing it. And then one, one more comment. I mean, I certainly remember the time when as a conservative talk show host, I would look to, you know, I would read George Will or Charles Krauthammer, or I would read a David French story from National Review on the air. And this was the source of our information. I don't think that happens anymore. I don't think that that the more serious voices on, on the conservative movement now provide the material for the conservative media. The conservative media now wants the stuff from the Ben Shapiro's. They want the stuff, you know, that is the juiciest, that is the most intense. So there's been a real qualitative change in the content and the sources of the content that you get on conservative media. I, I, I agree with that. I do think, you know, there's one modification to it. And that is if somebody who's traditionally been opposed to Trump says something that is crit critical of Democrats, then that'll get read on the air. Like even Charlie Sykes says, right, right, you know, right, that, right. that kind of thing. Uh, but the <laughs> one it. thing, the one thing that I would say that's really interesting about a lot of right-wing media now, and 
I apologize. I had login problems for the on Zoom for the first time in pandemic. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, but I, one thing that I think is really fascinating about right wing media right now is how uniform it is in its messaging. You're going to hear the same stuff on the same topics almost all day, every day. You now there's variations on how they much they might emphasize this aspect of it or that aspect of it, but it is absolutely remarkable how relentless the entire machine is in highlighting the exact same things. And it's not just the exact same things, it's the proper way to deal with the exact same things. So I'll give you a really great example. Uh, over the summer, this incredible wave of concern about critical race theory, yes, which was also supplemented by there is the one way to deal with it, which are these bills going around. And heaven help you if you disagreed, not just on whether how much of a problem critical race theory was, but on the way to deal with it. So if you said, hey, look, there are a lot of things that are very excessive about a lot of this diversity, equity, inclusion stuff. And, so, and there's some aspects of critical race theory that are deeply troubling. And civil rights laws enable us and empower us to be able to sue when that happens. No, 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 no. Right. That is not what you can say. What you have to say is I'm going to jump on board with these anti-CRT bills right. that are all over the country. And for the first time, I saw conservatives writing things that conservatives, people I'd like saying things like, well, it's a bad law, but it's better than no law. What? No, <laughs> no. So it, you, you have these waves. And then as the wave crests, it's sort of like heaven help you if you're saying, I'm not all the way on board. Like, I agree with you on a lot of stuff, but I'm not all the way on board. Yes. Well, that's the worst. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're as good as the enemy. Yeah, I, I thought of two other examples of the sort of herd mentality you're talking about, you know, when you mentioned it recently or this year. One was when uh, the whole thing about Biden's going to ban hamburgers. And right. then like that became like a thing for like, I don't know, 48 hours. That was like all over conservative media. And then, all, of course, all the Democratic candidates had to, like, post pictures of themselves grilling hamburgers to, just to reassure their voters. <laughs> and, and then more recently, with the supply chain issues, so somewhere someone got the marching orders. Oh, the, the message here is Biden is going to ruin your Christmas. And, and that became like for 24 or 48 hours, the whole messaging from every conservative media source I saw was about Biden ruining Christmas because of the su supply chain issues. Well, that's kind of like playing the greatest hits, though, you know, the, that the war on Christmas. Any anytime you can bring out the here's the new twist on the war on Christmas. I mean, that's been going on for, what, 20 years now. Yeah. That is, that, that's called playing the hits. <laughs> um, and and to David's point, you know, I mean, I there, there once was a time when, of course, um, you know, people in the conservative media you know, used to have to work hard or at least a little bit harder to come up with the material. Now it's like this massive fire hose every day. So if you go on the air and you don't make all the points that David was just mentioning, you know, your audience probably has been stewing on Facebook and, and reading the Daily Wire and all of this stuff before you come on the air and they go, well, why aren't you talking about this? Or what's wrong with you that you haven't said these things, which I think contributes to the uniformity. So when people say, well, the real problem is the fairness doctrine, or the real problem is just Fox News, I think what you need to understand is going back to David's metaphor, it is, it is a tsunami. It is a multimedia tsunami. And it's one of the reasons why none of the hosts, none of the outlets are standing up against it with the exception of a few in print. And we probably should make a distinction between what's happened in print and what's happened on air. Although you've seen similar pushes as well. I mean, you know, David used to be at National Review. I used to write for the Weekly Standard. We kind of know what the story is there too. Yeah, that, that actually brings up another question issue I wanted to ask both of y'all. And that has to do with the paywall issue. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are getting the misinformation from conservative media, there is no paywall, right? Um, that, you know, they, they sell, it's the, the MyPillow ads. You watch the MyPillow ad and then you're in. 
<laughs> and and you're good to you know but so much of the best journalism that's out there is behind a paywall so how is that influencing sort of how the, the how it's skewed as far as like the types of media people are consum- consuming is that a problem David, you want to- uh, I have some pretty, I, I tend to think that one of the problems with media is that we don't have enough paywalls. Um, it, it used to be that you paid for your news. Like I'm old enough. I know Charlie's old enough. You're, you're like a six months older than me or so, Charlie, I think, I think so, but, at least, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got the Lexington Herald leader growing up in Georgetown, Kentucky, and I, I got time in Newsweek. I subscribed to national review going way back. I paid for news. And so I, what ended up happening with the rise of the internet is, is there was a kind of a fateful mistake that was made that was to say, all of this is going to be free. All of this is going to be free, but you, it's not free to produce, right? It's not free to produce. So how do you generate a revenue model? Well, because there was this sort of tradition that says it's free, the paywalls, a lot of people hated paywalls. Well, then it's subscriber dollars. I mean, uh, or then the pay, then it's advertising dollars and, or you go nonprofit and it's donor dollars. Well, the advertising dollars began to incentivize the clickbait, right? They incentivized this, um, the, the clickbaity headlines, they incentivized the sensationalistic stories. And then as much as the nonprofit model in some ways is better, it also made you captive to donors specifically big donors. And so both of those models had built within them sort of the seeds of their own demise. And so, you know, I know for the bulwark, you guys have paid subscriptions. Not all your stuff is behind a paywall, but some of it is. Same for us at the dispatch. Some of it is behind a paywall, but not all of it is. And part of the reason for that is we wanted to avoid these negative incentives that we recognize we're human beings like everybody else. And if your entire revenue model is built on vacuuming eyeballs off of Twitter. You got a lot of bad incentives. So I think actually the rise of paywalls is a positive development. It's a positive development. Um, And I don't just say that as this sort of self-serving, hey, subscribe to my paywalled content. But I think it's getting us back to a model of journalism that was more independent, less sensationalistic, and less susceptible to sort of donor control. No, I, I agree with everything um, about that. I, I would I would also say though that it, it, it's somewhat misleading to blame the you know the the echo chamber the growth of the echo chambers just on the paywall because you know I this is the reality that we live in is that you can have the best journalism in America right now the best investigative journalism and forty percent or more of the country will never even hear about it and would not accept it. I mean, I remember this back in, in 2016 um, when uh, I think the Washington Post was doing a series of investigative reports into Donald Trump's charities. And I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and David Fahrenthold uh, went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. And I remember having him on my radio show and, and the reaction of the audience was, boy, this is awfully interesting, but I'd never heard of this before. And I think that's accelerated where whether it's because of the paywall or not, we live in two different information universes. And so, um, you know, every once in a while, there'll be this big debate. Well, this revelation will have this effect. This will move the needle. And the reality is, no, it's not going to move the needle because tens of millions of people don't even know what happened. See, I mean, there was, there was once a time when we had sort of, you know, a common basis of reality, you know, the, the media universe that David was describing. You had a newspaper, you know, you watch the networks. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's great that we've democratized the media, but also um, to realize that there's no longer that that unified audience. So the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the, uh, the, the Washington Post, uh, others have done amazing investigative reporting. And one of the reasons why it has no effect whatsoever is because of these alternative universes. And and the flip side is that you can have the most egregious kind of disinformation that is disseminated out there. And there's really no forum to refute it. There's really no place, no fact check is going to make a difference. You know, I mean, you know, NPR fact checking something from Gateway Pundit is not going to change 
um, the minds of the right wing audience. Um, frankly, I'm sorry, the Washington Post, the New York Times, those folks aren't going to be able to do it until you have trusted voices on the right that says no, that say no, this is BS, this is false, this is disinformation, nothing will change. And unfortunately, as I think we've discovered, is that when you do that, that the, the likelihood is that you will be canceled for that. That's actually kind of related to my next question. And it's also similar to the first question in our chat. John Daly asks, do you think it makes sense to engage friends on Facebook when they promote false, incredibly irresponsible information? So do, imagine you're, you're advising uh, a friend uh, who comes to you and says, oh, my, I have this uncle, you know, Uncle Bob, who is just, He's a great guy. He loves his family, loves his job. But he started listening to this talk radio or this YouTube radio guys. And he now he's like, he thinks the, the vaccine will kill people. It's killing people. And he thinks Trump won the election. And he's coming over for Thanksgiving. What do I do when he starts talking about this stuff? <laughs> oh or what, what, what do I do when he posts this crazy <laughs> stuff on Facebook? You know, what, what would you tell, what, how would you advise this person how they... What do they do about Uncle Bob? <laughs> uh, okay, for number one, talk about football. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious because here's the deal. You, there's so much more going on with Uncle Bob than that conversation can address. And I think that one of the things that we end up doing, I, I get this these kinds of emails all the time. And they say, when I write about conspiracy theories or the stop the steal or QAnon or Christian nationalism. And they'll say, they will be uncle Bob or aunt Betty or my dad or my grandfather. And, and he, there's this um, Jonathan Hyde illustration about persuasion that I think everyone needs to understand. And it's called the elephant and the writer. And we spend all of our time talking to the writer. Now what's the writer? The writer is sort of the rational mind where it's the part of us that says, I'm thinking that two plus two equals four. So therefore I will behave that way. You know, that's, that's the rational mind. And we like to think that we make all of our decisions right up here in that rational mind with the writer. But what's the elephant? The elephant is everything else about us. It is our friendships. It's where we grew up. It's our, it's sort of a, um, our, our background ethos, et cetera. And what Hyde has said is that if the rider doesn't want, if the elephant doesn't want to move, the rider is not going to move. And so if Uncle Bob is coming in here and he's got an elephant and a rider and you're having a two hour shout fest at Thanksgiving to the rider, number one, you're just ruining Thanksgiving. And number two, you're not moving the elephant that if you really want to get to where people really are, you have to dive into their lives and to have relationships with people. And and so, you know, I remember when I was a trial lawyer, I, I remember reading Jonathan Haidt's uh, description. And when I was doing trials, I'm, as I read that description, I thought, oh, this connects with how I try to persuade a jury. Number one is I try to get them to want to rule for my client. Like wh where, where I try to reach them right here in the heart. <laughs> and then they're very open to the head. They're very open. But if you don't hit the heart first, the head is not going to take them anywhere. And so that's one of the reasons why one of the first questions I often ask people when they say, well, what do I do about my uncle is my response is how much time do you spend with him? Yeah. It's just that simple. How much time do you spend? Cause the chances are, it's not just that they reach to this head thought. It's also a part of their meaning, identity, and purpose as to who this is, who they are. This is what they stand for. It's often related to who their social circle is, who's, who are their friends. And, and I'm sorry, you're just not going to argue them out of that at Thanksgiving. So talk about SEC football. Yes, that will also be healthy for you to, to, to do that sort of thing, by the way. Sorry for the dogs <laughs> who are here who, who think this is all very interesting. Um, so I, I agree with all of that. And I, I think, you know, look, um, we've all had this experience. And, uh, you know, and, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, you know, encounter someone like this, and I'll say, I'm, I'm just not going to engage on the issues like that. And part of me feels that I'm being cowardly, I'm backing away from it. On the other hand, you, you know, look, there are, there are some divisions where if, if you confront it head on, you're just going to destroy a relationship. But to John's point, 
if this is ever going to get turned around, it's going to be these trusted one-on-one sources. It, it, it is going to be that person, if the person trusts you, it, you know, gives you that assumption of goodwill and knows that you're a good person, and then at that point you say, you know, no, I disagree, that I think will be effective. But I mean, that's what it takes, mm-hmm. you know, for example, as opposed to the, shall we say, you know, cable television approach, which is to say, you people are all a bunch of redneck bigots. Would you like to hear my ideas now about critical (laughs) race theory? Well, no, you know, once someone decides that you have contempt for them, or you're not listening to them, or you look down on them, they're unpersuadable. There, there's, there's no conversation that goes, you know, you, you, you are a bigot and your mother's ugly. Would you like to hear my ideas on taxes? That conversation is over. It is done. I think Arthur Brooks talks about, you know, the the power or the danger of contempt. That once you roll your eyes at someone mm-hmm. and someone thinks that you regard them with contempt, there's no conversation that's going to take place that will be constructive after that. And I think that's absolutely true. And by the way, this is one of the formulas of conservative media, which is, and it's one of the most potent formulas, which is to say constantly to tell the audience they hate you, they're coming for you. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and politicians understand this as well. So let's say that Donald Trump is attacked by somebody. One of the things that he understands to do is say, they're not attacking me. What they're really doing is they're attacking you. Now, of course, he doesn't always stick to that because he's a narcissist and with incredible thin <laughs> skin. But you know, the, the, the point being to constantly um, you know, build the bond with the audience by saying, we are the only people that respect you. We are the only ones you can trust because these other people you know, the New York Times despises you. The Washington Post thinks you're X, Y, and Z. The people on NBC have these feelings about you. And, and once people internalize that, it, it does, you know, it does shut them down from being persuaded from, for it, from, from that direction at all. You know, one thing just to add to what Charlie said, one here, because I, you know, I, as you might imagine, because I talk about all of this stuff for a living, that a lot of folks in the offline world want to talk about it. And what I found is there's a giant difference between a conversation that begins like this. I'm going to tell you something versus what do you think? You know, that the, here's what happened in Pennsylvania, David, versus here's what I heard about Pennsylvania. What do you think? The first one is I, I want to divert from that conversation. I want to, I want to, you know, if this is a relationship I want to preserve and I value, you know, if people are much more than their political positions. And I, you know, I really don't want to be in this position where you're fracturing relationships because of somebody's view on the election in Pennsylvania. I'll divert. If somebody is like, I heard this, what do you think? That's an invitation to dialogue. And, and, and that's where you, you dive into those dialogues. But I, I really do get very weary of the, what the, here's, here are your talking points for Thanksgiving Uncle Bob <laughs> kinds of communications. No, 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 no. Treat Uncle Bob like a human being. And if his mind is closed on something, it's not your job to batter down that door between the hours of 1 and 5 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day. Um and but if Uncle Bob really wants to have a conversation, that can be an enriching uh, relationship building moment where you talk about what's really true. It's just you just got to use your kind of your common sense and your intuition as to what kind of situation are you confronting. Um, yeah, are you muted, Charlie? Oh, we lost your. Yeah, no. Could I make? I I muted because the dogs were making so much noise. You you didn't want to hear them. Um, (laughs) The uh, one more comment about Thanksgiving, even though it's become kind of a a a cliche, is you you think about most of our communications on social media now, where if you don't like somebody, you just swipe, you just swipe them away. You are one click away from completely canceling them. You don't have to engage with them in any way whatsoever. You can just you know blink them away. Whereas at Thanksgiving dinner from one to five o'clock, you, you, unless, unless you want it to end really badly, you're kind of <laughs> stuck with that person. You know, that's the, it's the power of, of the, of the face to face sort of thing, because the, the social cost of me just simply blocking you or muting you on Twitter is absolutely zero or it's close to zero. 
However, if I try to do that in person at Thanksgiving dinner, the price is exponentially higher. So that changes that. So it is an opportunity, but David's absolutely right. If you, you know, start off the meal saying, you know, um, you know, hectoring somebody, it's, it's not going to go well. Uh, attendees, you can start posting your questions in the Q&A. And if, if y'all see any of these that you particularly want to answer, let me know. But uh, let me go ahead and read. There's, this is Brad Edwards wants to, uh, is asking about social media. Uh, you know, so many people get their news from social media these days. But his question is, uh, a common de denominator in all these shifts in media seems to be social media reaching a critical mass of economic influence that moved incentives primarily from ad revenue to social media traffic that then relies on anxiety, dopamine to incentivize click-based engagement. Is that valid or likely at all? If not, to what degree level of influence is social media playing in all these changes in incentive structures? Um, well, I'll, I'll just briefly go first. I think one, so two things, as, as we say on social media, two things are true at one time. One is, Social media is often overblamed for our problems, which are really our problems. You know, Twitter was in its infancy. I'm reading this great book about um, uh, one of about every two years, I seem to read another great one volume history of World War One. So I'm in the middle of another one of those uh, reading one volume histories of World War One, and now my social media history is a little rusty. But in July of 1914, in August of 1914, when everything went to crap. I think Twitter played a minimal role. Um, we are very capable of ripping our civilization to shreds without social media, as we have demonstrated time and time again. So I think we often overblame social media thinking if we can fix Twitter or fix Facebook, then things will be okay. At the same time, it is also true that social media works as an amplification um, and it amplifies sort of all what we are. It puts human nature on blast, both the good elements and the bad, bad elements. And this is important. Not all social media is created the same. We, we use the term social media as if it's sort of all the same blob. It's not. Twitter is its own thing. Um, if Twitter were a state, it would be the most democratic state in the country. If the power users of Twitter were a congressional district. It would be the most democratic, one of the most democratic congressional districts in the country. The, the power users of Twitter are disproportionately, overwhelmingly progressive. And so that if you are one of these people who lives on Twitter, you're going to have a really distorted view of this country. And I'm, I'm kind of convinced that the more time you spend on Twitter, the less you know about the United States of America but then I'm in a catch 22 because it's also the number one way in which people find my work <laughs> is on Twitter. So on the one hand, you say this, this site is really feeding both right-wing paranoia, sometimes left-wing overconfidence. It feeds a lot of extremism. Oh, and by the way, this is also where a lot of people who are trying to get a refuge from that find dissenting voices. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mess but it's also overblamed, in my view. I'd love to hear what Charlie thinks. Well, I, I agree with everything. I mean, th this is, you know, you go back to the various disasters in human history and you understand, you know, that, that, that human nature um, was not invented with, with Twitter. Uh, but let me just take it from the other point of view, which is the, is, you know, at, at one time it took work maybe to assemble the lynch mob or the mob. Um, now it's right there all the time. And it is the amplification that you that you have, the amplification of the disinformation. You know, and I was, you know, I, I've been reading about uh, the period of, of reconstruction and the, 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 the divisions and the violence back back then, um, which I think has been underappreciated in American history. Um, and, you know, you, you still, you, of course, you had lynch mobs back then, but, you know, you had to assemble them, you know, at the, at the local tavern or in the courthouse square. Well, now you can do this through social media. And I think that that makes many of these things more dangerous. So, you know, look, like, like everything, when something amplifies, it can amplify the best, you know, in us. It can actually, you know, strengthen ties. It can get the word out about valuable things. 
Um, on the other hand, it can also amplify the darkest impulses among us. And, and, that's, and that's what's frightening because, uh, you know, you think of it in a country of 300 million people, let's say that only 1% of them have been deranged by this rhetoric and believe that they need to engage in some sort of violent insurrection or in some sort of political violence. 1% is 3 million people. So um, that's, that's part of the problem that we face right now. It's one of the reasons why I'm very, very concerned about all of this, that if you're fed a constant diet of this um, and, and the, 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 the question or, you know, talked about the dopamine hits. You know, this is what I was getting at earlier is that that constant need to, to up the dosage, to, to come up with something that is more exciting. You know, you think that was bad. How about this? Watch Tucker Carlson. He's continuing to move the dial further and further and further, at, you know, recognizing that the dopamine hit that might have, you might have gotten three years ago is not, is no longer sufficient. So he's dialing it up. He's dialing it up. Well, what happens? What happens after a, you know, to a society or an individual who keeps, you know, upping the intensity level like that? And, and, that, and, that's, what, and that's what's frightening about what's happening now with social media. Well, I mean, with, with, I'm sorry, with, with all of this media, including social media. Yeah, I've, I've been really worried about that, too. There's just the potential for inspiring violence. I mean, they, they do enough to where they say, oh, I'm not specifically you know, encouraging violence. I think of that Paul Gosser video that came out this week where it shows him killing AOC. Um, there was like a tweet this morning for, from J.D. Vance. And of course, that Tucker Carlson special that you talked about and we uh, started a petition about. Um, I, got, I mean, is it going to take something awful happening before people start to like pay attention to this stuff? Well, we've already had awful things happen. I yeah. mean, you think about all of the things that have actually already happened. You know, the the, the massacre in El Paso, um, the uh, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, the, the shooting, you know, at a at a, at a black church. Uh, you know, January January sixth. We keep saying, well, is it going to take something really really horrific? Well, we've actually had it, and it, it's not even a speed bump here. Look. You know, <laughs> in, in, a, in a rational world, Paul Gosar's tweet is a joke, you know, but but look, Washington Post front page today, school board members all over the country are getting death threats. Um, the uh, Republican congressman from Michigan, Fred Upton, uh, if you've if you've listened to that uh, that voicemail, getting threats against himself and his and, and his family, election officials all over the country who are also getting threats. This is a very volatile situation. And, you know, there once perhaps was a time when thought leaders might have said this would be the moment where it's really important to dial it down, to not engage in the kind of rhetoric that might pour kerosene on all of this. That's gone. I mean, I'm just I mean, that that's the extraordinary thing about, you know, Paul Gosar. It's, it's in this environment. This is happening. And the grownups had just like looking the other way and going, well, this is this is the way things are right now. Yeah, I you know, look, the the idea that there's talk of stripping committee assignments from Republican members of the House who voted for the infrastructure bill that 19 Republican senators voted for. Right. But there's no apparent move to strip anything from Paul Gosar. Right. And that the Republican caucus rejected stripping uh, anything from Marjorie Taylor Greene and took the full House tells you a lot of what you need to know. Yeah. right now about the, the the culture in that caucus and critically the culture in the grassroots uh, there was this this piece in the politi in politico where a congressman was quoted as saying i hear about civil war every time i go right. home um i was just doing a, a a podcast earlier today where i was saying you know, one of the things about the United States of America is we've always had conspiracy theories. I mean, I grew up reading uh, various alternative expl explanations of JFK's assassination, for example, um, you know, various alternative explanations of the 1960 election. I mean, we've always had that element there. But let's say you have 100 people and let's even be 
say 50 of them are kind of conspiracy curious or conspiracy theorists, if they're not engaged in politics, if they're not driving the bus, that's a man, that's a problem. It's a manageable problem. Right. If you have the 50 who are conspiracy curious or conspiracy committed and they're driving the bus, the political bus, that's when you start to have a real problem. And if you go to the grassroots around this country, I mean, where I live, a lot of grassroots Republicans are furious at Marsha Blackburn. Marsha Blackburn for not supporting Trump enough. 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 And so that's when you're talking about who's driving the bus. And that's where it gets really scary. Because if somebody's in the back of the bus Googling Pennsylvania ballots, that's le- it's a problem. It's just not as big of a problem as the guy driving the bus Googling Pennsylvania ballots. And that, that's, you know, that's one of the problems that we've seen is that the, the most right. committed people in a lot of this grassroots world are among the most paranoid and conspiratorial. Well, and, and, and think where a lot of it comes from. It comes right from, from the former president him, himself. And by the way, you know, speaking of social media, this is sort of just, just topical. I was, I was thinking about the kind of message out there. You look at, at right-wing social media today, do you know what they are really obsessed on? Defending Kyle Rittenhouse, who is you know, the young 17-year-old that, that killed two people in Kenosha, Wisconsin. You know, and I, I agree with David. You, you said you can think two things at, a, you know, at, at the same time that he shouldn't have been there. You know, he, I, I think he's going to be acquitted. But I think what you're seeing here is, the, is making him into a quasi martyr hero or Ashley Babbitt. You know, now you're starting to see this sort of celebration of people who have been involved in extreme acts of violence so that, you know, these become kind of symbols. And this is this is a real thing right now. And it's at, at some point, if you glorify and glamorize, you know, kids with, uh, you know, AR-15s, you know, on the, on the street, um, geez, what could possibly go wrong? You know what that reminds me of uh, is the way in which in the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman situation, it wasn't enough to say that there's an open question as to whether or not, you know, Zimmerman shot Martin in self-defense. You had to defend Zimmerman from A to B or from A to Z. You had to say it was how dare you critique him? for following a, a young black kid walking into a neighborhood, not doing anything wrong. How yeah. dare you think that it was something wrong with this guy sort of taking on the role of amateur yeah. cop? Yeah. And, yeah. and so what ends up happening rather than saying, look, that was irresponsible behavior. Yeah. You do not follow somebody at night for no good reason. Imagine if you're walking alone in the dark and somebody's slowly following you in a vehicle. That's a scary thing. That mm-hmm. shouldn't happen. You couldn't say that. You had to not only be all in on due process to sort of see where the evidence took you on the case, you had to be all in on the Zimmerman guy. And the other thing that is so awful about sort of the Rittenhouse discourse is how many of these people on Twitter who are lionizing him for going to Kenosha with an AR-15 as a 17, I, mean, I believe it's 17 when he went. Yeah, yeah are sending their kids to the next riot. Right. They're not doing that. Armed Armed to the next riot. They're not doing that. How many of them are going there? This is a bunch of LARPing going on, but it's dangerous LARPing because there's some piece of the audience that wants to make the role play real. Well, and, and, and to your point, one of the things I think we're getting at here is that um, this media environment is very hostile to nuance. You know, for the person who says, well, okay, you know, you can hold both these ideas in your head at the same time. Well, no, I'm sorry. Then you're a cuck because that's a sign of weakness. If you are, you know, you know, thinking that, well, perhaps this is, you know, complex. This new media environment is very hostile to complexity, uh, to any of that and, and very, very impatient with it. All right. I'm going to. Uh, I'll read one comment and then one question uh, for the uh, praise for y'all's work. Uh, Nathan Briggs says, I like emailed newsletters, the dispatch and the bulwark, both have a good collection of them. Can that be a way forward for responsible conservative media or just the last gasp of old ways? (laughs) 
I don't know, Charlie. Have we reached peak newsletter yet? I don't know. You're 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 pushing that. I mean, you you, you have a new <laughs> newsletter, so we're all pro newsletter. Just understand right now. You know, I I, I like the format. I, I do, do too, very much. I I do too. I think one of the things about a newsletter is that it it's it's sort of an alternative way of creating that kind of bond with your audience that Charlie talked about before when he was talking about being on radio. Um, but it's through the written word rather than, you know, three hours of extemporaneous speaking. <laughs> but I like the format. I like the format. And I think that um, I know I, I read Charlie's newsletter every day. I read a number of newsletters every day and I benefit from them. And I, and one thing I intentionally do, I have increased newsletters and I have decreased Twitter and life is better. I will just say that because I'm reading the best expression of people I disagree with rather than their 280 character burst of thought. And so I would say it's a good practice and habit for politically interested Americans to in up with the newsletters down with the Twitters. I, I would agree with that. Is there a place that both of y'all go to out of habit first thing in the morning for your news? <laughs> I'm going to be really, I'm going to, I'm going to go full dispatch here. We have a morning news newsletter called the morning dispatch. That is a great way to start your day. It's going to talk about the top stories of the day, quick hits on some of the minor stories. So it's a great way to go, but you know, look, I'm in this world. So don't ask me for tips because I'm trying to read everything. <laughs> um, and if you, yeah. if you're, if you're out there making a living outside of the world of news, you can't, you know, it, it to sort of say start by reading them all it's not a good it's not a good tip okay well so this is an argument um that will sound contradictory to what we just said but um i do use twitter as kind of a news feed um but i also am very have been uh, increasingly aggressive in blocking and muting people so that i don't have a lot of the of, of the sewage but it is a way for me to see what's out there what's going on because i don't want to miss something i mean i want to be able to start the day uh, I want to know, you know, what's on the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, what's in Politico. Um, but uh, there's no question about it that one of the values of, of Twitter is, is as kind of a, a, a newswire, what, what the AP newswire used to be back in the day. So um, that will be one of the first things that I look at every single morning. All right. I think we probably have time for one more question. This one is about deplatforming. Uh, do you think the platforming, if applied consistently, can be an effective way to combat disinformation and extremism in right wing media? I'm thinking in particular of the cases of Infowars being banned from all major platforms and the recent Twitter ban of Emerald Robinson. Uh, David, why don't you jump in? You're, you're, an old, you're an old friend of Emerald Robinson, right? Oh, pals. <laughs> pals. <laughs> that, um, that was irony, just so people understood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say as a strategy, deplatforming is a really, it sort. let me put it this way. There are, there are people and statements that go so far beyond the pale that it, that it can almost become a form of self-canceling. You know, for example, Milo's, some of Milo Yiannopoulos' right. statements right before he was banned from a number, a number of platforms his, it wasn't so much the, the deplatforming that did him in, it was his statements if you try to deplatform somebody who has a constituency within a large group of people, the deplatforming in a weird way is one of the better professional days of their lives. Um, if so, the more there, there are people that the more you try to boycott them, the more you try to marginalize them, the more they go running to every right wing media outlet that will have them and talk about how they're getting canceled. You know, right. when, when a book publisher says to, Josh Hawley, I don't, we don't want to publish your book. That's a gift to Josh Hawley. It's a gift. Good fundraise so, yeah, off it. Fundraise off. So I'm very, I do think there are things when it comes to, there are things that people can say that, that are beyond the pale. Um, I, for example, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of, of deplatforming at all. But by January 6th with Trump and Twitter, we were talking about almost a national security, not even almost, we were talking about a national security issue here. And there, there was a compelling reason to deal with that. But as a default tactic, no, 
Stay away from that. Do not. That is a, that is a great way to increase polarization and to actually perversely enough magnify the voices you dislike. I guess I, I have more mixed feelings, although I appreciate um, David's point, especially because anytime you restrict, try to restrict speech, what happens is you, you don't end the speech. You just shove it, you know, underground where it can take on, you know, much, ug- much uglier form and will still be there um, at some point. You know, the the the, the Infowars folks or the, the neo-Nazis will find their own platforms, will find their own way to communicate with their audiences, um, you know, away from the mainstream. And in many ways, that might make them toxic. Uh, they, they'll, they'll find a way to do that. On the other hand, I have to say that my mixed feelings come from the fact that I was surprised by the effectiveness of deplatforming Donald Trump. Um, and what it did for the the quality of our political discourse, at least short term. Um, I, I think that the world is better off without um, major social media platforms treating Emerald Robinson as if she is a reasonable um, or intelligent or worthwhile voice. Um, it, it's, it's a dangerous thing. I, I guess my, all of my instincts are against censorship of any kind. On the other hand, you know, one of the great principles is there's no moral obligation for a private company like Facebook or or Twitter to provide a platform for lies, disinformation, or raw bigotry. And, and so the drawing of lines, I think, is useful, but the danger is, as David has pointed out, real as well. All right. Charlie Sykes, David French, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. All right. All right. Thanks Thank you, lot. guys. Thank you.